The following is a conversation with former iGemmer and current entrepreneur from UC San Diego, Varun Goville. He was the team leader for the 2018 project Epinoma, which focused on improving cancer diagnostic methods. Much like us, they combined bioinformatics and synthetic biology to improve on an existing concept. In this conversation, you'll hear about Epinoma, SporeCore, machine learning, and science communication, among other things. So I looked at you, your uh, past iGEM website. Um, I don't know mm -hmm. how much has changed since you've taken Epinoma um, and turned it into a business. Um, yeah. But I know that much like our team this year, you guys are kind of combining computational biology and synthetic biology. Um, you made a pipeline as we're doing. Um, so could you just explain a little bit about um, how you use machine learning, how you used it to identify yeah. cancer markers? Yeah, absolutely. So when our team started looking in, into the methylation space, what we realized is that, as you mentioned earlier, there needed to be sort of two components. So obviously you have your biological engineering of your protein that's going to be able to detect and quantify the methylation. But you also, just as importantly, need to know which sites within the human genome are going to be the most relevant for whatever you're studying. So methylation has different levels of utility for different types of diseases. As it turns out, there's a lot of data that's been generated over the last few years with regards to methylation and hypermethylation in particular through, um, there was something called TCGA or the Cancer Genome Atlas. Mm -hmm. um, and the lab that we were working through um, was also very strong from a computational standpoint. So they had access to private and clinical data sets that we leveraged in order to identify um, what markers would be the most prevalent and which ones could be the most useful, especially in the application to early diagnosis. Right. Okay. And so basically, yeah. um, from what I understand, the previous methods had, hadn't been looking at epigenetics. They had been more focused on um, directly DNA and protein. That's right. Right. So that's 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 the so that's sort of the paradigm shift that we wanted to enact on um on a clinical level. So right now, when clinicians or clinical lab techs are looking or trying to diagnose an individual with hepatocellular carcinoma, they look for two different things. So they look for a protein marker assessment, um, known as AFP or alpha fetoprotein. Right. Um, that can be found in serum, or they look at somatic variation. So basically, the idea is that there are specific alterations to the genetic code at specific sites um, that can be tracked and are implicated in hepatocellular carcinoma progression. So that's and that's been sort of the body of literature that has been built over the last um, decade or so. And then there's been this shift recently to understanding that it's not just about the genetics, but there's this whole level of transcriptional control that occurs one layer above that, and that is the epigenetics. Um, and that's where we started looking at methylation as, as the most prevalent signal, so yeah. Right, right. And you mentioned um, hepatocellular carcinoma was your uh, disease of choice. Um, yes. But it's easy to see that um, when you look into your pipeline a little bit, that it could be used for other types of disease markers, not just um, hepatocarcinoma. Have you seen that applied anywhere else or? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. And so in our own work, when we were designing the platform, it was with this vision that we would be able to apply to n number of different types of cancer, not just hepatocellular carcinoma, that was our proof of concept. That was where our initial data set came from. Um, but as the epinoma has turned into a business, we've actually focused more on colorectal cancer, it turns out. Colorectal cancer has a lot stronger methylation signal that is much more consistent and agrees with what tissue samples are saying. And so we decided to pivot in that particular direction. Um, not to mention that there are a number of companies in the liquid biopsy space that are already looking at methylation. So you have Freenome, which was started by um, a few people here. Um, they're looking at methylation signals amongst other things. So they do like a multi-analyte approach. You have Grail, which just filed its IPO yesterday. That's backed 
that's an Illumina spin out and um, is building its Galeri test platform and has presented at multiple ASCO conferences saying that methylation is the most powerful signal that they've seen across almost six different cancer types. And some, some um, papers I've read have suggested even up to 20 cancer types where methylation is applicable. So it's definitely a very exciting time to start being able to harness those technologies. Mm -hmm. It's an exciting time also just for um, bioinformatics in general. I feel like uh, you guys applied it to the medical field um, and with COVID-19, I know a lot of biologists are turning to learning coding, learning the computational side of things. Um, yeah. Do you think that we're going to see because of this, like a massive acceleration as far as computational? Um, yeah, uh, I think I think that's a fair thing to say. I think that definitely during this time, you're right, there has been a boom in terms of the number of computational approaches that have had to be utilized or that people have had to come up with. Mm -hmm. um, just because, I mean, there's no other way to study this thing right now. Um, and sort of using any sort of structural guided insights or things that you can get from modeling different receptor interactions um, that could potentially lead to the development of a therapeutic or a vaccine is very promising. I think though, um, the what I wanna say is I think there's gonna be an influx of bioinformaticians, but it's not like the existing scientists, like the people who are already in the field aren't the ones that are going to drive that change. It's going to be like the new wave of scientists. Right. Like, I mean, the new age scientists that have both the wet lab and the dry lab skills together. Mm -hmm. But not really the older um, generation that's working on this current vaccine. So I think that's part of the challenge. Yeah. Um, like and something where you'll see some growth. Yeah. Yeah. I know personally, I've definitely taken more of a more of a liking to the computational side of things. Whereas uh, <laughs> when I started off, I you know, saw myself working in a lab. Um, but yeah, just working with the new tools and, and seeing what's possible. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of excited for that. See, the other, the other challenge is also, especially with regards to machine learning, like there's a reason it's become like a really big buzzword. It's because, you know, people are trying to shoehorn it into literally everything. But mm -hmm. what you have to realize is the, quality of the insights that you get from a machine learning algorithm are only as good as the quality of the data that you're putting in. And because there's never been really a push for standardizing data collections, like, you know, you have some large scale project, like the human genome project, cancer genome methods, the new one that's coming out, whatever. Um, but there isn't really a push to standardize data collection. And so that's what I think is fragmenting some of the work that could be done on a larger scale. Um, that's just my personal interpretation of why I think machine learning is a little bit gimmicky, even at this stage. Right. Um, so you're basically saying like there's better methods that could be used in machine learning, but because it's such a, a trendy new um, type. Right. Like everyone wants to get into machine learning, and but yeah. when you when, when you get into it, what you realize really quickly is that don't no one really understands how the algorithms are working. It's a black box. So you're just like, I put in some data and I get some insights and then I try to generalize it to some model. Problem is, if you don't understand how you went from step A to B, how can you be confident that that is actually generalizable um, is one of the key concerns that I personally have mm. when I see the machine learning work. Anytime I see machine learning, I'm here, I'm like, I, let me look like their, you know, how robust was their data collection, how robust was their data analysis, um, and what is the significance of the insights that they've been able to derive? Are people just, you know, sometimes there's a pressure, I think, to say that machine learning drove the discovery or the innovation, when in reality it was something else, but machine learning takes a little bit of that credit, you know, just because you have some pseudo-computational element in it. Right. But, okay. yeah. People are just excited to use machine learning. Uh, in their project and so they kind of will talk it up exactly a portion of their project than it is yeah and when we were we were certainly certainly guilty of this in 2018 our what we had to make sure was that can we justify the rationale for utilizing machine learning 
and are the right controls in place? And that's why we, we analyzed almost half a million sites, really. Um, I, I still have the data on my computer to this day, um, but it was very meticulously mapped out out of a 2,200 patient cohort that our PI had run in Sun Yat-sen uh, Hospital in China. We had that data. We utilized that specific data set to make those connections. Um, and so we were really fortunate because if it was just us scraping stuff off the TCJ, I'm not so sure that we would have had the opportunity to discover really novel biomarkers for hepatocellular carcinoma at that time point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I just want to take it back for a second. You mentioned um, liquid biopsy. For people yeah. who don't know what that is, could you uh, yeah, explain that? Yeah, absolutely. So right now, um, sort of the status quo method of cancer diagnostics is something known as tissue biopsy. And so the idea is that, you know, you know, sometimes if you feel a lump or you see something that looks abnormal, mm -hmm. uh, the surgeons or the clinicians will go in and they will use essentially a needle, a fine needle, um, to perform a core biopsy. So they essentially cut out a piece of the tissue and they will do two things with that. First, they'll embed it in wax and study it under a microscope to look for any signs of morphological changes that can be tracked to cancer. And then they will extract the genomic DNA from that and then look for any uh, genetic alterations that can be also traced to that particular cancer. So that's tissue biopsy. Problem is that tissue biopsies are expensive, invasive, and actually not all that accurate. Um, and so there's been this recent push in years to pivot to a less invasive or a minimally invasive format. Um, and so looking at um, floating DNA or floating nucleic acids in blood, urine, or saliva is what constitutes a liquid biopsy. Right. So how do, you, how do your probes uh, change that or make that better? Um, so, oh, sorry, um, which part specifically, sorry. Um, so just for liquid biopsy in general, um, when you're looking, yeah. you're using it to look for these uh, disease markers, correct? Yes, so yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so there's two aspects to it. So the first is the protein that you choose inherently. Um, so we chose a high affinity variant of the methyl binding domain protein. So that has been characterized since the 1980s to be able to bind to symmetrically methylated sites. And so we were confident that it could detect something, maybe not at a very robust level, but you can use that as a logical starting point. Well, what our team really came up with was the um, the development of a graphene oxide nanomaterial platform for signal amplification. So that's a lot of words that sound could be absolutely bullshit, so let me explain it. So basically, um, we found this nanomaterial called graphene oxide that has two interesting properties. It serves as a fluorescence quencher, and it has really high affinity to single-stranded DNA, but not double-stranded DNA. And so the idea was when you incubate with these probes on the surface of like, let's say this palm is like a graphene oxide. So you have the probes sticking up and because it's single stranded, um, it's, it's very tightly bound to the surface. Right. What we also did it on the probe, we attached a fluorophore. So when it's on the surface of the graphene oxide, it's turned off essentially. It's in a, in, in a zero state. The minute you flood the system with let's say your target DNA, some non-specific DNA and some random fragments, the minute it binds to your target DNA, two really interesting things happen. So you've now bound it, but it's creating a duplex. So the single strand of affinity is gone. It's actually gonna detach off the graphene oxide surface and activate the fluorophore. So now you have a fluorescent signal that you can tap to. And then through various catalytic digestion methods, so you can use um, exonuclease three and you can use a couple of other things that we did. Um, you can amplify that signal much stronger than what the traditional methods have been able to accomplish. And so that's how we have a much improved sensitivity compared to what previous um, methods had entailed. Wow. Yeah. Huh. That's a really impressive uh, design idea that you guys have. Sorry, say that again? 
That's a, that's a really impressive design. Yeah, it I was, it was very, um, we were looking, so that was the, I think, of course, strength of our team was we were all interdisciplinary. So I came from a bioengineering lab, place background. everyone had lab experience, but it was in different domains. Um, one of our right. key lab researchers came from analytical chemistry, uh, came from biochemistry. We had bioinformatics on our side as well. Combining all of those insights at the core, I think, is really what made everyone believe in this vision and ultimately it was um, within the time frame. And did your whole team, um, did your whole team transition over when you turned epigenomics um, into a business, or did did some? No. So we have a we have a core team that has stayed on, and a few people that have decided to do other things or just didn't have that much interest to begin with. So now it's more about the um, the entrepreneurial angle. In the beginning, it was really a bummer. Um, I think it took us around two weeks to adjust. But what we realized is there's still, you know, like labs reopened, not full capacity, but, you know, labs started reopening up the end of July, basically. So we're like, okay, we know that there's going to be the slowdown period. And that's the time we took to really solidify our vision, align our core values, and really bolt down our business fundamentals. So it was kind of a blessing. The other thing is because of Zoom, people's availability has sort of exploded counterintuitively. We yeah. were able to get a lot more meetings with people who typically would be very difficult to get their time or their expertise. And so we've been able to really meet some, some top-notch world-renowned experts who have been guiding us on this process. So it's been, it's been okay, I think. Definitely less of an impact than I had initially anticipated. So that's, that's nice. Great, man. Yeah. How about your guys' um, development this year? Uh, yeah, I definitely think availability is a huge thing. Uh, pretty much everybody that we've reached out to has been able to meet with us. Um, just because. What about in terms of your uh, like genetic parts development or your algorithm development? Oh, well, obviously the lab closures have affected that massively. Yeah. We can't, we can't get into a lab this summer. Um, so uh, iGEM has changed a little bit with the metal requirements. Who's your, who's your PI at Davis? Uh, Mark, Mark Fasciotti. Uh, okay, because uh, we've been speaking with Dr. Justin Siegel, so I, I know he did, he helped a few iGEM teams in the past as well. A few Davis iGEM teams? Huh? Davis iGEM teams? Uh, he, I think he helped the 2014 iGEM team, the one that did the olive oil. Yeah, so, yeah, he's... He's, he works on like protein design and design of commercially novel enzymes. So he's been helping us sort of fine tune our approach with our protein as well. We also have um, Ian Korf, Dr. Ian Korf on as a, um, oh, nice. yeah, he's our kind of our Python coach slash bioinformatics uh, advisor. That's great. I'm, I'm glad to hear that despite everything, you guys have a solid, um, mentor base i think it's very important yeah it was, uh, it was a little touch and go at first just because uh you know we came in with the expectation of a lab idea we were setting up this whole experiment um this whole design for uh assuming we would have a lab and so we yeah. kind of had to switch uh just on a dime uh to bioinformatics but i think we're making it work awesome that's that's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, thanks, man. Is there any anything else you want to touch base on? Um, I guess just uh, how is how is everything going with the um, with the business and with your any other research you're involved in right now? Sorry, you you cut out on the last ten seconds again. My bad. I guess just how is everything going with um you know the business or anything else you're involved in right now? Yeah, I mean. I think we're actually in stealth mode. So like what we have on the website is, has, has pivoted quite a bit, actually. We're still in the methylation space. We're still building novel technologies, next generation cancer diagnostics. But um, it's, been, it's been a really, really, I think, grueling but slowly rewarding journey. Like every week we learn something new or 
we, we, you know, we get feedback sometimes in a nice way, sometimes in not such a nice way, but it, it's really pointing us towards what we ultimate, where we ultimately need to be. So I'm always appreciative of that fact. It's definitely a hard journey and it's good. I think the team is all in it for the long run. So that really smooths things over, you know, when you have a, like, I think August, the last two weeks of August for us were pretty rough. And then the first two weeks of September have been like decent. So it's like, gosh, like, you know, the back and forth constantly. Yeah. And, and the everyday work. And I'm still a, I'm still a grad student. So trying to balance all of that is definitely uh, the definition of insanity. But we're, we're yeah. sticking it through. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it sounds like you got a dedicated team, though, man, which is what you need. Yeah. They, they're, they're all stars. So awesome. that's what you need. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then one last thing. I know you guys uh, on your website, you talked about how you have that communication paradigm with um, uh, healthcare experts. You had um, all sorts of cancer patients, um, a long list of people that you talked to. Um, yeah. Is there anything that you got out of those discussions that you uh, think other iGemmers can apply to their project? You know, I think, I think maybe not in those, unless they're like also in the liquid biopsy space, in which case we have a ton to discuss with them. Um, I think it's more of trusting, or having a communication paradigm to begin with, because I think a lot of teams go straight into, I, we're going to talk to this doc, we're going to go talk to this type of person, we might go in an academic, oh, maybe, you know, you industrial engineer. So, and there's our IHB. Um, it was really important for us to really incorporate the feedback that we got at each step. So we made a very conscious effort out of every meeting. It was like, okay, we know here, here's some form of our idea in, in our head. Let's present it as is and see how badly it gets torn apart. Yeah. And, the, and you know, it, people like, I think one of the things is like scientists, you know, from my experience, like things get torn apart, you sort of like isolate yourself and like, okay, I'm gonna go prove everyone wrong, right? And be like, ah, like see this technology worked or this approach worked better than you thought it would. Um, but it became a really collaborative dialogue in the sense where you're like, okay, so this doesn't work. Um, do you, what part of it do you not believe in or what part do you think we're gonna have the most trouble in and then how do we, how do we mitigate that risk? Essentially? So because there's a technical risk to all of this work that we're doing. Um, and so we took it more as an exercise in risk mitigation and using those interactions to really hone in on what we needed to do and to guide our decision making at critical steps. Like we didn't have the idea of um, using the AI platform actually until we talked to a couple of people like Genentech who mentioned the power data science could have in terms of um, strengthening the methylation biomarker profiles that we were building, right? We also, um, I forget, we, we, we did some very cool stuff. There were very, there were very high level outcomes that came out directly out of our communication paradigm that would not have been possible. Otherwise. I mean, it was a very structured way of explaining and it gave a really nice narrative to what we were doing. And that becomes really important, that storytelling ability when you then go try to make it a business and to communicate that constantly, whether it be to people you're trying to get on board, to investors, or just to you know, someone you're talking to. So, yeah. Right communicate with professionals because they know they know how it's done they've been there before yep right yeah and awesome, scientists are notorious with that so you know that is yeah <laughs> yeah uh, well i mean uh thank you for communicating with me man i know you're probably really busy thanks for taking your uh time out to do this no absolutely this is very fun i i really like it when i jump reaches back out or someone and the iGEM community reaches back out and it's like, oh, why don't you talk to the work yeah. you did? And I'm like, it's a nice uh, trip down that we went. So thank you for that. But, yeah. yeah, no worries, man. Yeah, absolutely. Feel free to reach out if you need anything else or you want to discuss how you know, this project is going or how you're going to go about like a week construction. Happy to help give any advice on that front as well. Thanks yeah. so much, man. I'll keep that in mind. Yeah, take care. You too.